great to talk to you today. And thank you, Dinesh, for introduction. Uh, actually, HIV is not new now. The global health is uh, living with HIV for more than five decades. Uh, today, actually, I'm going to talk about uh, what we already knew. I'm, I'm going to refresh the knowledge and also what is new in HIV. Uh, these are the outline of my lecture. Globally, 38 million people living with HIV. Uh, first case was diagnosed in early 1980s. Then in the battle of AIDS, we lost many lives. And uh, however, after the introduction of antiretroviral therapy, deaths are coming down. So therefore, the, now the global uh, annual death rate is going down, but the people living with HIV, uh, the number increasing. Um, also with the antiretroviral therapy, uh, they live longer and near normal life nowadays. Uh, with the new interventions of prevention, the new HIV infections also going down in worldwide. When we take the distribution of HIV infection by population, the majority of the infections happen in key population. 62% uh, among key population and 38% among the general population in the world. So, in the context of HIV, who are these key population? The men who are having sex with men, what we call gay people, so the uh, short form we call them MSM. The female sex workers, beach boys, uh, transgender women, and IV drug users. In some contexts, prisoners also come to come under this umbrella. However, in Sri Lanka, they are belong to vulnerable people. Uh, so the here uh, key population MSM female sex workers, beach boy, transgender, and drug users. MSM, um, UN, uh, UNAIDS or the United Nations says uh, the male during like four to twenty percent of men in their lifetime at some point have a sexual exposure with a man could be abuse or could be like in a childhood or the adulthood experience, some point of life. That's an incidence, uh, homosexual behavior at some point of their life, 4 to 20% of worldwide male population. However, the MSM represents 3% of adult male population of the world. That means the predominantly homosexual behaviors or Exclusively homosexual men are 3% of our adult male population. And gay people, they are actually at risk due to different biological and behavioral reasons. Uh, behavioral reasons mean like uh, due to uh, many countries still, uh, they are, uh, st there are stigma, uh, stigma and discrimination against them and the laws against them. So, uh, due to social pressure, they don't come for testing and services. So they, the, the poor uptake of HIV testing is there. And annually, condomless sex among uh, MSM are rising. So those are the behavioral factors. The biologically, uh, because they are having anal sex, and especially the receptive partner or the partner who's lying bottom at very high risk for HIV and other sexually transmitted infection. When we take the body fluids, and uh, secretions of fluid also with HIV infected person highly concentrated with HIV virus. So biologically, they are more vulnerable to HIV infection. So the transgender people, transgender, transgender mean like uh, born biologically, born as a biological male or a female. However, they feel themselves as the opposite gen gen gender. Therefore, they have a severe gender dysphoria like condition and they like to transit themselves to other gender. Transgender women, who uh, biological male who transit themselves to women. Transgender women are high risk for HIV infection. The reason, the behavioral reasons are they practice commercial sex work, chemsex is there and again the stigma plays a role and the laws and all things. And other thing is they practice anal sex again and gender affirming surgery, sometimes the vaginoplasty and all, they are for transgender women also vulnerable to HIV infection than the general population. Again, female sex workers, beach boys, and intravenous drug users are at risk for retroviral infection. 
This is the local epidemiology. At the end of last year, we have diagnosed more than 5,000 cases in Sri Lanka, and you can see there's a rising number of cases every year. The drop we observed in 2020 and 21 due to the economic crisis and the transport facilities, but last year also there are more, more than 600 cases. If you notice, the blue line is the men diagnosed with HIV, and over the last years, there's still the women lay, lay in the low level, only a small amount of women diagnosed in Sri Lanka with HIV. Same as global situation, key population account for the 56% of new diagnosis in Sri Lanka. Again, MSM account for more than 48%. And interestingly, you can see casual sex, casual sex partner interactions also account for 16% of HIV infection in Sri Lanka. You can see commercial sex workers 3%, client of sex workers more than that. So the, again, key population account for many infections. This is, the, this is how WHO and UNS define different type of HIV epidemics in the world. So that Sri Lanka, we belong to because our general population HIV prevalence is less than 1%. So we belong to low level epidemic. Uh, the concentrated epidemic is HIV prevalence is consistently over 5% in any defined subpopulation like gay people or the sex workers like that. Generalized is HIV prevalence consistently over 1% in pregnant women. Alarming sign is we are heading towards concentrated epidemic according to the last year behavioral surveillance. We have found for our MSM population, the HIV prevalence is nearly 4%. So though we always say we are a low level epidemic, we are heading towards uh, concentrated epidemic very soon if, if we don't act. And um, every year, like when there's some crisis going on, you see in the newspapers, they are saying many university students uh, positive with HIV. We found many school going youth present with HIV. But the, this is the true data. Like you can see every year from the diagnosis, nearly 10% young adults diagnosed with HIV. Last year, when it is come to 600, like 60 cases from the young adults, 15 to 24 age group. Again, the majority among young boys. The youth account for the 10% of our new HIV infections. We all know the transmission can occur sexually the, through the blood and blood products and maternal transmission. Maternal transmission can occur uh, during the pregnancy and the high risk during the last trimester, then delivery and again breastfeeding. Okay, this is a RNA virus. This replicate dividing in a T4 lymphocytes. The special feature is they can lie dormant or the in the latent stage in a lymphoid tissue. They cross blood and uh, they cross blood vein barrier and the HIV virus load is very high in the blood, CSF, uh, semen, uh, like fluids. Uh, concentration is less in cervical secretions and also in the breast milk. But however, in semen. Uh, CSF, anal secretions, those uh, fluids we take high in uh, HIV viral load in HIV infected person. Uh, this is what happened once a, a virus enter the body, there's the acute HIV infection. During acute HIV infection, virus replicate as much as possible and there's a high viral load and transmission is very high during that stage and patient, they are not aware whether they are infected, then they go into chronic stage. Chronic stage, they replicate slowly. However, they can transmit infection, but less compared to the early and late stages. At the late stages, after years, uh, they, they replicate more and damage to the immune system is very high and they lead to a AIDS stage. <clears throat> These are the symptoms of acute HIV infection. Most time after the HIV infection, uh, within the first two, four weeks, they get acute HIV syndrome. This is because it's simply like a uh, viral flu. So most people don't diagnose it as a HIV. They, they think this is a simple flu. They got sore throat, joint pain, fever, uh, limb swelling, and mouth ulcer. So acute viral infection feature. Following that, they into uh, latent stage. 
So WHO categorized HIV uh, late late uh, HIV stages to a uh, four stages. Stage one is patient is asymptomatic or have persistent generalized lymph adenopathy. This is stage one. We 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 always miss these people. Otherwise, they come for voluntary testing. Uh, in Sri Lanka, still the one third of people diagnosed at very late stage. Uh, in contrast, in Martale, that situation is even worse. Uh, this year, I have diagnosed seven cases up to now. This year, uh, six out of seven diagnosed at very late stages. And like, this mean country situation is one third, but our diagnosis, more and our, more, almost all our diagnoses are at very late stage. Uh, stage two, uh, we see these patients at our wards and clinic, but we don't suspect because there are many common cases causes for this kind of presentation. So the unexplained weight loss, less than 10%, especially recurrent respiratory infections, or it is upper respiratory tract infection, basically, uh, they can present and dermatological infections are very common, fungal infections and the herpes, soft players, and especially the seborrheic dermatitis like condition, which is not responding well to treatment, and these lesions are extensive. So many dermatological condi conditions we can see at stage two disease. Recurrent oral ulcerations, fluidic papule eruptions also common. Stage three, we again we see these patients, the weight loss greater than 10%, prolonged unexplained diarrhea, pulmonary TB, luckily all the patients uh, positive, find positive for the TB, uh, screen for HIV, vice versa also happening, and severe systemic infection. Adults usually present with recurrent bacterial infections, we have to suspect about HIV, and many mucocutaneous conditions again, especially the uh, periodontitis, uh, esophageal candidiasis, oral hairy leukopakia, like many oral and conditions. We don't miss a patient at stage 4. Usually stage 4 is AIDS indicating condition, so every time they check for HIV. They are wasted, PCP pneumonia, extra pulmonary TB, and CMB and, uh, CNS toxoplasmosis, cryptococcus, CME encephalitis like infection, and AIDS defining cancers are also there, Kaposi sarcoma, uh, B cell non Hodgkin lymphoma and cervical CA also a AIDS defining condition. So at this stage, usually we don't miss a patient, but when we diagnose a patient at stage four, high morbidity mortality is there and know the cost for the system is very high and they have transmitted infection to many as well. So usually a normal patient person has a CD4 count is around 1000, no more than that. We live with a CD4 count around 1000. But uh, if a HIV positive person has a CD4 count above 500, we are very happy. But when it goes down, if they have a low CD4 count, usually below 500, they present with TB-like conditions. And if someone has a pneumocystis pneumonia, uh, candida, usually definitely CD4 less than 200. When it's come to toxo or the uh, esophageal candidiasis and the esophagitis, then it's, we know when, when you refer to us, we know this is a, a case below 100. And when it comes to cytomegalovirus infection, the retinitis or the cryptococcal meningitis or the atypical mycobacteria, definitely very poor CD4 and CD4 sometimes come as 3, 4, like less than 50. Uh, I go through this quickly. This is the life cycle. It's a RNA virus. It enters the body. Then uh, it's a cunning virus. Using the reverse transcriptase enzyme, the RNA uh, part, they convert into a DNA part and they this is the point, they integrate it into host cell genome. That's how the, in some lymphoid cells, they go into latent stage. Some cells, they, they reproduce and they mature into new particles and destroy the CD4 cells. So the became a DNA particle and integrate into the host cell genome. That's the thing that we cannot eradicate this virus. We only can suppress the virus. HIV drugs at all these four points, and uh, these are the kind of antiretroviral therapy we have, entry inhibitors, and the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors we have, integrase inhibitors we have, protease inhibitors, and maturation inhibitors. Maturation inhibitors still not in practice, more on the uh, research phase. 
other than the inhibitors all the other drugs are available in sri lanka and now we have different scheduled different regimen available for the patients so we have all these drugs other than the entry inhibitors because some of the viruses go into latent stage only what we have to suppress the hiv we still cannot eradicate the virus this is the concept we practice from 2017 but the uh, sometimes the healthcare practitioners and the, even the general public not aware we call this u equal u this is called undetectable equal untransmittable once a HIV positive person started on antiretroviral therapy, as soon as possible, they became undetectable in their peripheral viral load. Even in their other body secretions also, their virus viral load is undetectable. So undetectable person cannot transmit it to any other person by sexually or from the occupational exposure. So the people who are on HIV medicine regularly, so they are not risk at all for the occupationally or the sexually. We have couples, zero discordant couples, marrying and having children and they are having uh, nice families. So because if they are on treatment, there are no issues with their lifestyle. Now we don't talk about condoms with the zero discordant couple if they are on treatment. This is the target UNH sets for the, all the countries. So 95% of world population living with HIV know their status and a month in 95% on treatment and a month in 95% on viral suppressors. Suppress. You can see at the end of 2022 where the Sri Lanka stands. It's not bad comparing with the regional countries. Okay, about the screening test. Uh, screening test, all these screening tests available in the all the district STD clinics as well as the Madhali. So we have ELISA, part, these, all these point of care tests and lab-based tests available at Madhali. And uh, you may aware, initially, the confirmation we did, we sent a sample to Colombo and we have to wait till the West, Western blot report come because the Western blot confirmation only available in Colombo. Because of the cost and transport facilities, now we adhere to new method. So the confirmation can also now uh, arrange at the district STD clinic because we use three rapid test system that WHO introduced. So three different type of tests we uh, do in our labs. If all three become positive, we take it, take it as a confirmed case. Now we don't have to wait for uh, weeks to Western Broad reach us till they get the confirmation. And special location like DNA PCR, because it's a RNA virus, it's an infant we suspect, we do the DNA PCR for the early infant diagnosis. This is, uh, we all know the HIV, there's a window period. Once the virus gets into your body, you have to wait some time to get it detect from the test. But you can see with the available new uh, fourth generation test, now the window period is very short. Uh, viral load test, usually we don't do this for the diagnosis. Viral load we do in, only in the special cases, especially if a pregnant woman, if we suspect zero conversion or something. Uh, usually what we do in our lab, the fourth generation antigen antibody ELISA. So within the 15th day, after day 15, the third week, we can diagnose. So the very narrow window period. And also the when the uh, JMO office or the, when the ICU, if they send us a rapid blood test asking for a result urgently, what we do is antigen antibody combo. It also have a very short window period. So the, now the window period is very narrow. These are the uh, blood rapid tests. We do this in the clinic and also we do this in the outreach because they both the serum and the blood both can use for the HIV rapid test. Uh, the window period is very short and we use this point of care test. The order quick is the self-test. So if someone is interested, they can online book or they can come and collect from our clinics. So they can get do a oral, oral HIV self-test from their buccal mucosa at their play home on their convenience. Or a quick HIV self-test, it belongs to point of care test which detect only antibodies. So it has a window period of nearly more than one month. We have to tell this, but these are also available. Some Sometimes they order and get through the NGO so they can collect from us. Uh, the last part, when I come, when I went talk about HIV prevention, when I joined the program also, initially we talk about condom, health education, awareness and all, but still, despite all these new infections are happening. So now we have to adhere to new modes of HIV prevention. So the, these star, the stars are 
Like now we talk about pre-exposure prophylaxis, male circumcision, vaccines, and uh, microbiocytes. So but HIV vaccine, uh, sometimes I feel it's a joke because Corona came. Within one year, we got four or five vaccines successful. But now this is the fifth decade of HIV. So many trials going on, so many money wasted, but still we fail to find a uh, good vaccine on HIV. All these, these three trials, all these vaccines, uh, they showed very good antibody response against HIV infection. But unfortunately, none of these antibodies are neutralizing HIV virus. That, so they have to terminate the trial. So that, uh, the antibody response is good, but not neutralizing. Uh, then we discuss about this is for the high prevalent countries because two thirds of cases of global HIV cases living in sub Saharan Africa. So it's about voluntary male medical circumcision. This is, it's a, this is no benefit for women, benefit for men, heterosexual men. No studies among uh, transgenders or the gay men. For the heterosexual men, it is very effective, around 60%. Uh, so WHO recommend this for high prevalent countries. The thing is, when we take the male genitalia, penile shaft and the fifuse, outer space is it's a keratinized epithelium. But inner fifuse, inner fifuse is not keratinized and there are it is rich with Langerhans cells. When during a sex activity, the foreskin is pulled bare. So the exposure to sexual secretions is very high. And the area is rich with the Langerhans cells. So what happens if the other partner is positive for HIV, they update the HIV virus very quickly in uncircumcised men. That's the reason we are talking about voluntary male circumcision in HIV and other viral STI prevention. Then the pre-exposure prophylaxis, you may have heard about it. We talk about condoms, one faithful partner, but these things are not uh, affecting or the, the HIV incidents are not coming down. So pre-exposure prophylaxis is showing results. It's available in the country as well. So the people who are continue to have high-risk behaviors and who are not happy to wear condoms, they can take a oral medication. And this medicine uh, could be oral medicine and also injectable medicine as well. By having this blood medicine, uh, the, the concentration on their bloodstream and genital tract so they don't get HIV infection from other partners. So the, the, all these studies showing pre-exposure prophylaxis medicine as a good method of HIV prevention. First of all, the best uh, solution for the HIV prevention is treatment as prevention. When we detect early and when we treat all the positives, so they cannot transmit it because they are undetectable. Then, the second role play by PrEP for the key population, we are promoting PrEP. So the PrEP, they can, uh, this is effective for heterosexual, gay people, transgender, and the drug users. So they can take a tenefavir and emcetabine, only reverse transcriptase, two drug combination, single white, one pill. There's a two formulation. One for the renal insufficient people, we can use the TAF formula. Other one, we can use the TDF formula. So they have to take a, once they are engaged in high risk behavior, they have to take a daily medicines. But there are people who are not taking high, not doing high risk behaviors or the chemsex or these events or the parties. So they, they need event based prep. So they don't like to take it daily. So like they said, once in a month or three months, we I meet my partners and the things. So that in week, there's something called event based print. All these are available through STD clinics. So that what they have to do is 2 to 24 hours before the sexual activity, they have to take two pills at once, then 24 hours later one, 24 again at the 48 hours, other pills. So there are only uh, four pills for daily prep. And if they continue to have this activity, so the, till the activity is finished, they can continue the medicine. And again, after the finishing, 24 hours, 48 hours, and they can finish the daily prep. Daily prep is very popular among some gay people. Okay, then the uh, other method of HIV prevention. So the cabotegravir we use for the treatment experience people who are developing resistant for oral drugs, but now it's a good alternative for prevention. Uh, currently we don't have, but very soon we get our cabotegravir uh, lot also from WHO. So they every two months they have to take their injection to prevent the HIV acquisition. 
other thing this is for the female sex workers so the female who cannot uh, like if they have a positive partner who is not willing to take treatment so they can start an on oral prep or there are if they don't like to take a pill there are depivirine vaginal ring it's a uh, locally acting but the con compared with the injection or the oral tablets this is not very effective some studies say 30 say 30 percent some said cumulative 50 percent effective so locally acting that monthly they have to only change the ring this is very popular among not in sri lanka still but very popular among commercial sex workers The other thing is forced exposure prophylaxis. You all know if an occupational exposure, pick injury or something happen, you have to come and to get the treatment within 72 hours if it is a high risk exposure. So the forced exposure prophylaxis is also two types, occupational exposures and for uh, occupational exposures and also for sexual exposures also, we are now giving forced exposure prophylaxis. Uh, when we assess the case, most of time we don't uh, prescribe post exposure prophylaxis because to give it, the, it should, uh, uh, like we see this ESSC thing, they're like the virus should exit from a positive patient in a sufficient amount and uh, it should survive in the environment and enter into the healthcare worker's body. So after assessing this, we decide whether you need PEP or not. Prophylaxis, if you start, you have to continue. This is post exposure, you have to continue. 28 days. Again, sometimes we see a lot of uh, sexual abuse cases, a lot of trauma, and so then those people sometimes need post-exposure prophylaxis for sexual exposure. Again, the same medicine, they have to continue for uh, 28 days. We have to we take decisions by case by case. Why we are asking you to come early as possible within 72 hours? This is what's happening. So once the virus enters the body, we think First two, three days, they get into your lymphoid tissue. Once they enter the lymphoid tissue and some go into the latent stage, there's no point of giving post-exposure prophylaxis. That's why we have to give it as soon as possible. Better within two hours, but we give up to 72 hours. After that, they settle in your body. Against uh, sexual exposure or against occupational exposure, they have to present early. Um, this is non uh, se post exposure prophylaxis for sexual exposure, usually recommended for the anal sex, especially the bottom partner, and recommended for the insertive partner as well. The, the vaginal sex, as, a, as I mentioned, not high risk as the gay people. So they we consider, depend on the case, whether there is a trauma or anything. So the depend on cases, we have post exposure prophylaxis, especially if you sometimes everyone who after a sexual assault and don't like to go through the JMO process, but they may worried about their sexual uh, risk, risk on getting sexual transmitted infection. We give sexually transmitted infection prophylaxis for the other infection as well as for HIV if indicated. And uh, this is the last thing. This, is, this may be helpful uh, if you know the young people and like many don't like to come and go through the OPD. To our clinic, actually, they don't need to go through the OPD. They can directly come because it's a walk-in clinic. But people are not aware, so they don't like to come to their GP or they are sometimes through the OPD. They are shy and because of the social stigma and also they are, so this is available in Play Store. They are developed from the National STDAS Control Program. It's called No For Sure. So they can log into this and they can decide whether after there are some questions, they, they can assess their risk and also they can select whichever the clinic they can go and online book appointment. Even Martale also, if, if they wish to come to Martale, we, we usually have four appointments, four online appointments per day. So they can get one of these slots. So the other, either they want post exposure prophylaxis or if they want prep, or if they want to just get a test or get a self test kit, any, anything they can book an appointment and come. This is for the all district STD clinics. They can. Uh, they don't need to discuss with even doctor. They can log into this app and assess their risk and come to our clinic. It's very easy and um, now it's popular among young adults. These are the things I want to uh, talk today. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, would like to answer. Would we uh, short for the procedure? 
treatment uh, give rise to the resistance uh, in the long term? Uh, resistance only happen if they get infected so, only. So, 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 yeah, the resistant always develop at the presence of virus infection. So every time we uh, we do the HIV test and issue the pill, it we issue that. But the, the the window period and things we have to consider. This is especially not coming from the oral prep because it's short duration. This resistant risk once will arrive when the cabotic dose is available because it's two months, two month dose. So somebody can miss the dose at the second month and come at the third month. Till the low uh, antiviral, because uh, oral prep, T half is 72 hours. So they, they have that thing. So the cabotid cover, the problem is even they infected within the viral RNA, we can miss the new infection. Because low level, drug level persists for many months with the cabotid cover. That happened with injectables. Uh, uh, now what we are practicing is fourth, fourth generation. So all are, all are like the what we do the rapid test is 99.9% .9 sensitive. Only the specificity is less. So the, all the tests we are practicing these days, 99% sensitive. At the moment, lifelong, they are, uh, we are keeping hope for Kyo. Luckily, since 2000, there are no such cases reported in Sri Lanka because the transfusion service also doing a good job. They are doing the good screening and, and also using the fourth generation test. But there is a risk because we see now a lot of gay people, they don't like to come to STD clinic. There is a trend among them. They come to repeated blood donation to get their screening done. That's a risk we see. That's why we promote these apps and all, but the uptake of this app is very good. In a normal ward setting or clinic setting, you can't assess the high risk behaviors. No, I know that, but the thing is, like, common things are common, these fungal infection, but like, it's okay to, uh, like, if you, like, because it's a COVID uh, stage two, three or two or three disease, it's okay to order a HIV test because testing facilities is also available. And now you don't need a uh, different kind of consent for a HIV test because we are testing for something which we have medicine. If we don't have medicine, even in earlier days, it was like a death sentence. So the people hesitate to test. Now it's okay to test because, like, I don't know, like all the, that's why I said this year, all the seven cases, six were eight cases. So, but we have in our practices, we have seen this patient, but we need it's okay to test if you have a slightest doubt. Do you need the uh, that's VRH. If the screening become positive, then you don't have to do anything, just refer to us. We do the may, may, may counseling. They are supposed to counseling for the confirmation. The thing is now confirmation also we can get the same date. Yes, sometimes there are defaulters, but we have a method because our PHI and the system train for that. So uh, we try to... Uh, reach them. But there are some cases that like even as in the TV program, so the, they default sometimes. And But according to the human rights or the, the things, we cannot uh, leak the case or we cannot ask area PHI. So we arrange it through the, our clinic system. Sometimes we get them back, sometimes not. Okay. Yes, no, I, Yes, if they are like they, they in some cells they go into latent stage and they stay dormant. That's why we we difficult to eradicate because we integrate into our cellular genome. But some cells they produce more and more replicate and they disrupt the cells cell at the last stage. That that's a viremia if they are as well as you uh, lose your immune cells as well. But the small percentage stay latent.
Thank you.